from Me University Japan and he'll be speaking to us about the clinical usefulness in and new topics in electrophysiology. Welcome Dr. Kondo. Thank you very much chairman. Uh, we are now waiting one more speaker so I would like to start from now. Is that okay? My talk is 10 minutes. Okay. Today I want to talk about new small ERG recording system. As all of you know, ERG, electroretinogram, is very important for the diagnosis for the many various retinal diseases. However, there are many disadvantages of ERG. For example, a large system is needed, and a pupil dilation is also needed. And also, inserting the electrode into the eye may be difficult sometimes. However, recently, you know, a new small ERG electroretinogram device is developed from American company LKC. This is very small but useful new device for the ERG recording. Only 400 grams, including stimulus system, a docking station, and also the one single skin electrode. ERG stimulus is given from small white dome here. And during the ERG recording, you don't need any pupil dilation. Because during the ERG recording, this system can measure the pupil size. And always, stimulus flash strength, luminance is adjusted to keep a constant flash illuminance. So you don't need any pupil dilation. What you have to do is to put a single tape here. No contact lens electrode. This electrode, skin electrode, contains plus, minus, and ground, all the electrode. Then you connect this tape to the retibar, small ERG system. It's very easy. Then you can start the ERG recording. What you have to do is just put the starting button. Very easy and a small ERG system was developed. See, this is a standard ERG, road ERG, cone ERG, and a mixed ERG, Fricka ERG, using this small retibar ERG system from normal eye, recorded uh, from my eye, this is. This small uh, ERG device is very useful, especially uh, from children, in children, because if you can put a single tape here, then you can record ERG, you can start ERG recording, even from four year, five year, or six, very small children, see? And also you can see on this monitor if this boy is actually opening the eye from this screen. I recorded ERG from this boy because the parents complained that this boy may have night blindness, strabismus, and also reduced visual acuity, 0 0.5 and 0 0.3. And the retinal uh, reflex is abnormal. So we suspected retinitis pigmentosa. Of course, we can do OCT. When compared to normal OCT uh, scan, this boy showed that only the ellipsoid zone was preserved in the central retina. But uh, finally, I would like to confirm this boy is really retinitis pigmentosa using full field ERG. We could beautifully record uh, ERG response from this boy. And the diagnosis was actually retinitis pigmentosa. Next boy was nine years old boy, fundus normal, angiogram completely normal, but he uh, complains reduced visual acuity and the photophobia for three years. What is the diagnosis? Visual acuity is 0 0.2. This is normal boy OCT and this patient OCT, this boy's OCT. When compared to normal, this boy's OCT shows abnormal ellipsoid zone, ISOS line and the loss of interdigitation zone. So 
something photoreceptive function may be abnormal. But for the final diagnosis, we need ERG. Using skin electrode retrieval new ERG device, we recorded a nice ERG recording. See? Road ERG is normal, but the cone ERG, Fricka ERG was severely, severely abnormal. So cone system is abnormal. Final diagnosis was cone dystrophy. Next boy is six years old boy. Complaints with high myopia, night blindness, and reduced visual acuity, 0.5 in both eyes, minus 8, minus 11, high myopia. See? You can see high myopic fundus in this boy. We recorded OCT, SD OCT. See? Ellipsoid zone was normal. So normal OCT scan from this boy. What is the diagnosis? Reduced visual acuity, high myopia, night blindness. Actually, for the correct diagnosis, we need ERG. Using skin electrode, retrieval system, we recorded uh, ERG from this boy. No road ERG, negative ear, flash ERG. So A wave is okay, but B wave amplitude was smaller than the A wave. So final diagnosis was complete type CSNB. Complete type congenital stationary night brightness. In addition to the application to small children, this small ERG device, retibar, is very useful for the screening for the diabetic retinopathy. Of course, for the screening of DR, Vanda's photograph is gold standard, you know, as you know. However, using this small ERG system, Fricker ERG can be recorded with only 15 seconds, very short time. So we recorded many, many ERG from normal eye and diabetic retinopathy patient, and we found that implicit time, timing, Fricker ERG timing, is gradually, gradually delayed with more severe diabetic retinopathy. Implicit time is, timing is very sensitive with the severity of diabetic retinopathy, see? A very nice correlation between the severity of DR and the implicit time, timing of free energy. Amplitude is not good. Amplitude is not high correlation. This slide shows the ROC curve for the detection of diabetic retinopathy using retibar free energy. And all, this is also the ROC curve for the detection of severe NPDR or PDR. We found that implicit time shows a very sensitive uh, indicator to detect any stage of diabetic retinopathy. Of course, Fanda's photograph is golden standard, but we found that this small ERG recording system, skin electrode system, can be adjunct to, to the screen for the diabetic retinopathy. So in summary, now in Japan, this retibar system is very popular because very small and easy uh, ERG recording system. This can be useful for the diagnosis of especially inherited retinal disease in children and also detection of diabetic retinopathy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Uh, one is that, uh, what is the duration for recording the ERG? The full ah, okay. If you'd like to record only Fricka ERG, the recording time is only 15 seconds. No, no. This uh, special ERG machine contains a special noise reduction system. Okay. That's why even with the skin electrode, we can record very nice uh, quality of ERG recording. Okay, that is why now J in Japan this ERG recording is becoming more popular. All right. Yes. And uh, it can record only ERG or can it do VEP also? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. This also can uh, have a stimulus. If you put the electrode here, yes, yes, every so kind of the ERG. Same, the VEP. same equipment can be used for VEP? B yes. So yes. We, we just need to change the electrode and the software? Yes. 
Okay. Yes, everything. So is it commercially available now all over? Yes, but Japan and America and Europe commercially available. But okay. I'm not sure if you, in India, mm -hmm. there are any distributor. But anyway, if you go to America, you can buy, purchase directly. Okay. You can bring. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Like it is like 70 or 80 prism diopters in the primary position. It's not even coming to the midline when you're doing a FDT there. Then probably I'll inject. Maybe 10% of my transposition surgeries will get botulinum toxin augmentation. Otherwise, I don't do it. But there we found out during my fellowship time, we have published that data. That if you find a tight media rectus, tackle that and then do the transposition. Yeah, yeah, the particular first case which I did was, was friends were coming out with real difficulty. So the idea was first to actually, uh, you know, loosen the MR or uh, make it as, you know, weak as much as possible and still give him a little bit of movement. Yeah, that's the problem. The sixth now palsy, the population is more than 50 or 60 usually. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to Duan, they are younger population. We can do three muscles also. Now, in any case, you don't have to do yeah. three muscles at a time. You do a medial lectus recession and do a transposition, which was not there. This technique was not there at that time. Yeah. Now, the there. medial rectus uh, recession also is mostly sufficient until unless the abduction limitation is very severe. So, this is uh, particularly you have to be careful that you have to have a severe abduction, uh, you know, limitation, minus three and more. You can't just go ahead, just uh, do a MR recession and SR uh, transposition just because, you know, you want to do less of MR and you don't want to limit abduction. So uh, there are cases where I have ended up in overcorrections because, you know, there wasn't so much of limitation and it was a type three which was, you know, missed. Very small... Uh, you know, adduction limitation. Consecutive deviation after medial lectus recession and transposition wholly depends upon how do you tackle medial lectus. Yeah. It has to be a balance, like walking in a ropeway, you, it has to be a balance. If you do too much, you'll get into abduction. It's better to do under correction than correction, yeah. I would say. Yeah, that's the rule. And here the confounding factor is the positive angle kappa. I showed you this particular case because he did not appear to have ESO as to a common ophthalmologist. So 25 years this guy just went around and around and didn't get operated. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Ramesh Kekunya for his talk on tumor. Uh, you know I'm going to show all the tumors so there is no big diagnosis here. I'm going to show few cases how they presented and how the ophthalmologist referred them. This is the kind of uh, insight I'm going to give. And uh, when to suspect and when to do imaging. Because all these cases I'm going to show are all tumor related or there is some lesion somewhere at the nerve level. So uh, it's not a surprise. You can say that imaging for every case. But how did I decide to image? That's what I'm going to give in this uh, few cases I'm going to show. Uh, at the outset, I would like to invite you all for the World Congress in Pediatric Ophthalmology, which is going to be in um, Hyderabad between December 1 to 3. Abstract submission has started. April 30th is the last day. And registration, early registration ends uh, in, on May 31st. So we, I hope to see many of you there. I will start with the case. This is self-explanatory. At this stage, probably at uh, five or six years, he was ortho, probably he had intermittent XT. You can see when he was in 9th or 10th standard, he developed uh, exotropia, which is in this photograph at least looks constant. Here he went to college. I think that time he got the surgery done. Uh, he had a right eye, which is a dominant eye. He got recess resect in the left eye. Records are not available. Uh, this is his post-op during his uh, post-graduation. Looks fine. And then he comes to a pediatric ophthalmologist, uh, many of them, uh, in fact. What you see is, uh, again, exotropia there. Uh, can you see anything else? But that's the clue here. 
he was actually posted as a recurrent exotropia and he was advised for repeat surgery. So this was the plan because they thought either the medial rectus which was resected is lost or slipped or there is a recurrence of his exotropia. Any clue here? There is a clue in this picture as well. If not, there is an obvious clue here. There is adduction limitation. And if you go back to this picture, can you see there is a small ptosis here. So there is a ptosis there and there is a adduction limitation. Pupil was not really abnormal. It was okay. It was not at all uh, an abnormal pupil. So this was just posted for recess resect, uh, resurgery and he came for the second opinion. So what I'm going to show here is don't miss anything. Don't assume things in life that, okay, this is definitely a recurrence or consecutive and do the surgery. So that's not the thing. Uh, every case, do a methodical. Look for lids, look for adduction, aberrant innovation, look for pupil sign. Everything else, he is fine. There is no other problem. He is 6'6 six, six in both eyes, fundus, anterior segment, everything is normal. But the clue is in front of you. You don't have to do an OCT or anything else. So we imaged them and you can see uh, there is a large tumor. This was not causing the third now. Uh, I don't have a picture of the skull base view, unfortunately. He had neurofibromatosis. There is a tumor along the third now course at the skull base level. That's why he developed this. This can happen because of inflammation or a period of time. It may not be there at the childhood. The initial one may not have been a third now palsy. It could have been a, definitely an intermittent exotropia. What he got after his post-graduation was this tumor was growing. Uh, Post-operatively, still he has that, uh, uh, somebody would have operated on him, they would have been right because it's, this will still not resolve his third no palsy. But he had a significant problem and uh, he underwent surgery. Fortunately, he had a lot of uh, steroids and things like that. And now he has an exotropy of just 12 prism adapters. We have just given prisms to him and he is doing okay. We are not doing any strabismus surgery. So that's one case. This is the second case. What you can see here is a obvious ptosis of the left eye. Anybody want to volunteer? What is this case? He had history of trauma, road traffic accident. He was not wearing helmet. He fell off. What do you think? It's, it's again very similar, right? Abduction is okay. There is adduction limitation. There is elevation limitation. There is a depression limitation. And he had pupil involvement. What do you think? This is a straightforward third no palsy, which is pupil involving. So what do you do at this point of time? You will wait. Obviously, if there are neurological signs, before they come to you, somebody would have imaged because in traumatic uh, third nerve palsy, you have to image just to rule out other things like uh, if they are neurologically, there is hematoma or anything like that, you need to image. Not for the third nerve part. He comes back after other cranial nerves are absolutely normal. There is no uh, other problems at all. He comes like this after a month. So what do you think? He has. So there is a traumatic injury happened. He did not develop aberrant innovation because they are known to develop aberrant innovation. He comes. Because of that trauma, there was concussion injury. He developed this high flow, probably high flow CCF. So obviously we did uh, imaging. You'll have to think because... This is uh, something unusual. You should keep it in mind that this can happen. It may not be a very common. We, uh, we see many traumatic third nerve palsies, but it just resolves on its own. It, uh, it just, uh, most of them resolve and some of them need surgery. Most of them land up in what uh, Dr. Madhu showed. They have aberrant innovation and you do the surgery on the normal eye and they get back to. So this is... Uh, you can see the, the scan there, dilated vessels, even the superior ophthalmic vein, you can see. Uh, all the muscles are also a little bit effused. So this is uh, a case of keratidocavernous fistula 
following third nerve palsy following trauma so that's one case so this is a case who was treated elsewhere as a recurrent diffuse scleritis he is on steroid for a long time so his redness is not coming down even after 2 to 2 and a half months of treatment and with this can you say anything can you see probably not with this there is a clue there which is not episcleritis not only one there are multiple clues there he cannot abduct his eyes this is in a busy emergency clinic many people this is what exactly the person has uh, missed there is abduction limitation a uh, little bit elevation adduction limitation and the second ophthalmologist who saw diagnosed him as six nerve palsy so if you carefully see ocular motility it takes almost 30 seconds to evaluate this patient cover test is people think cover test is the most important in my opinion both in strabismus neuro ophthalmology if you do a good ocular motility you can pick up many things either it is comitant incomitant small nystagmus ocular motility has to be a routine part of every ophthalmic examination that makes you think that this is not diffuse episcleritis so there is ophthalmoplegia i don't know this vessels look very very angry like that angry vessels for a long time what do you think again it's a maybe a low flow carotid or cavernous fistula and he is an elderly person obviously look at the size of the muscle it's long standing from two and a half months sometimes even they develop uh, increased intraocular pressure look at this uh, muscle they are so thick it looks like a thyroid nobody has done a imaging for this patient even if they have done some of them would have wrongly diagnosed him as a case of thyroid eye disease that's a possibility by looking at this imaging because that's a way uh, people think so this is important and then um, obviously he had all the signs of carotid or cavernous fistula we sent him to an interventional radiologist and his ocular movements of completely recovered the previous patient somehow after two to three follow-ups i don't know what happened to him uh, it is difficult to resolve on its own the first case traumatic it needs some kind of intervention here i know we followed this patient and he's completely all right uh, probably i'm showing many third nerves i guess obviously this is easy look at the pupil here look at the pupil straight away she looks a 80 plus lady there is no question diabetics also can have pupillary involving third nerve palsy but it's not an excuse not to do an imaging imaging don't do step by step like uh, strabismus sometimes we tend to do a stepwise surgery first ct scan let me get and then mri then mri so straight away right to the radiologist because most of the times it's a technician who will be doing the imaging right very clearly i want mri along with mra they don't have to inject anything for they just have to change the parameters mri with mra is the best diagnostic test at this point of time if you add contrast that will be great but sometimes in an 8 year old probably it's not a good idea here you have to directly go for the money that's what we are we are specifically wanting a mra here and uh, there is a anisocoria and uh, fair enough you will get a definitely you know exactly where you are doing so again it's ocular motility 30 to 40 seconds of overall assessment people spend almost 15 minutes on cover test on these cases especially residents and the first year fellows they want to get the right measurement all that that's fine but these things are more more important uh, dr satyakarn also showed it can be even myasthenia so thinking you have to keep on thinking okay where do i go next with all these tests you need to think so this is a typical case of uh, aneurysm again the person can die in one or two days if you don't detect this one more third nerve palsy probably uh, somehow it's a coincidence <laughs> so variable ptosis he is on and off steroids whenever you give steroids he's fine 
and uh, this is the ocular motility again dr satyakarna showed that this could be a great masquerade so third no palsy recurrent treatment there is a diurnal variation what do you think generally it's myasthenia which in this case was not because there was no fatigability which was positive but old one or two pictures really were suspicious because her ptosis was completely all right and what do we do uh, dr uh, mihir was asking whether you do all the tests i totally agree that receptor antibody tests are not 100% diagnostic okay if it is positive you can rule out if it is negative we can rule in nothing like that we still have to go by empirical treatment which we did many ophthalmologists did for this patient still we could not she had three mris but asking for skull base this is what i was selling skull base mri is very important look at the path of this now this patient did not have any tumor along the path at the skull base you can see this is the third now looks uh, similar you have to compare with the other side then only you can say it's normal but this patient had some lesion here which the pediatric neurologist thought that it could be an inflammatory thing but it was not it was a schwannoma at that level encasing this ica here which was causing recurrent inflammation small size schwannoma can lead to third nerve palsy so if somebody thinks that this is a myasthenia i think that's the right way to go about this patient but after treatment what next you need to think so this is where this case uh, comes in so he has a lesion again we went ahead with surgery for this patient because it was recurrent coming back and forth uh, treatment is difficult we at least know that this is not ocular myasthenia this is also important from patient perspective i have two more cases can i show or can i stop here sure okay this is uh, definite esotropia his skull shape is a little bit different what do you think it's again very classical of something right what is ocular motility here elevation defective defective better what do you think it's it's a esotropia with brown syndrome does it change after this comprehensive evaluation is required right eye left eye there is pallor and there is some kind of collaterals there so when you see a collateral it's definitely most probably it's a glioma so you can see he has these spots cephalic spots in the body don't even look at only at the eye look at the body also at the same time again it takes 10 second but it's the desire to check for other things which is important and fair enough he has a large glioma there brown syndrome somebody can put it as a brown syndrome with isotropia again i i showed you earlier also i said earlier all these are strabismus but related to tumor imaging how do you decide depends upon the signs what you see this is the last case what do you see here this is a penetrating keratoplasty done seen in our, in our emergency clinic by the cornea fellows i don't want to blame them but this is what happened to this patient there is an abduction limitation when i went back to the notes it was there from day 1 they put it as traumatic corneal rupture or a therapeutic pk was done because of infection this is something everybody again it takes 30 seconds he had a pk very good outcome came to us after pk for diplopia this is after pk because of getting you can see a huge infiltrating tumor which is caused which was there before because of neurotrophic ulcer it has ruptured that's why penetrating everything is done but this is the way you need to look at the ocular motility um i i think i don't have time thank you thank you so much any questions uh, yes I had injected one patient with CC fistula. Post CC fistula, still there was a significant exotropia. Yeah. So injected with Botox, it took around eight or nine months for the uh, effect of Botox to go away. Patient actually developed something like a third now, all now palsies post Botox because the venous circulation is not normal for them and it just doesn't get drained away. Drained away. It takes long time. Very interesting. I never had this, but uh, 
very interesting. But that's the way we approach them because we don't want to do any surgery on them. We want to do some, but very, very interesting. The first case that you showed which had a CP angle tumor, Yeah. I would expect a 7th and 8th nerve involvement also. Yes, he had, mm. but uh, uh, probably in that case we did not check. We should have checked, uh, ideally. We thought that there is something incompetence going on. Mm. Even at that stage, I did not think it's a third nerve palsy. Mm. There was a ptosis. Sometimes once you do a recess resect, mm. palpable fissure becomes smaller immediately after post-op surgery. That's what we thought. Obviously, with that position, he would have seventh and uh, eighth nerve involved, which we did not think. We got imaging just to make sure that there is nothing else going on because the huge adduction limitation, I can't expect suddenly in an adult. Mm. If it was there from post-op day one, it can increase. Mm. Suddenly, so much slipped muscle in a resected muscle, we can't expect. Absolutely. In a recessed, probably it is possible. Mm. That's why I think we should be more of a detective job in our uh, approach. That's yeah. important. Yeah. And most of the people, they don't come back with the report, yeah. what has been done. Yes. Usually they don't, we don't know. We have to look at the scar and think this could have been done. And the case with the obvious direct type of CCF, traumatic, uh, they usually respond really well when they undergo embolization and coiling. These days, of course, coiling and they have such excellent methods of coiling that they respond in the entire chemosis disappears and sometimes the movement also becomes very very yeah, good that's what the second case underwent that uh, intervention radiologist intervention he's fine first patient somehow he lost to follow up he was on the you know non-paying category sometimes they don't come back I, I don't know why he did not come back so i don't have the result for that patient and your case uh, with pk yeah. uh, definitely highlights that we need to check the corneal sensations when you have a patient with a uh, little bit, or even if any cranial nerve is involved, we should look at the uh, the fifth nerve. We should not miss that. Yeah, probably in that emergency room, probably it's difficult to do a corneal sensation for a cornea fellow or even a residence. But abduction limitation will not be so much. Because patients is PL plus or counting finger one meter, people tend to ignore the ocular movement of that eye, which we can still elicit by doing a doll's eye or showing them light which in a busy OPD they think corneal ulcer is the only thing I am concentrating and they don't even have time to look and because this is the most important thing what kind of trauma he had is the most important question in a traumatic situation in any case be it intraocular foreign body or things but there the abduction limitation some of the optometrists has noted on the first post of when we went back to. And these patients will not come to a strabismus specialist on that situation. This is for the people to identify small little things, but it can make a difference. And also, if you have a corneal infection and you have a limitation of movement, even if it is in one direction, yes. one option, uh, one uh, diagnosis you're looking for is, of course, a nerve palsy, but then more importantly, you may be looking at an orbital involvement. Correct. Suppose exactly. there is there is an orbital cellulitis yes. or there is an orbital infection. Yeah. And the in any case, at that point of time, patient required an imaging. So that's the case. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Mahir Kutha. Dr. Satya for replacing, substituting me with uh, Nipa, who is not able to come for this uh, presentation. Uh, presenting the first case is a 19-year-old uh, male came, who is a cricketer by profession, under 18 player he was when he developed this problem, his complaint when he presented to his neurologist was a dizziness, headache, blood vision, especially when he would look, uh, look up and it would be worse in the lateral gazes following a fall a week prior. This is how he came to us. As you see over here, this looks almost like a pendular nystagmus, but if you see very carefully, there are a little bit of fast phases with the eye being recorrected, pulled down. Bilateral, downbeat, conjugate, nystagmus. 
and this was recorded by the neurologist and he was advised uh, further investigation. So when you see a patient with uh, downbeat nystagmus, your first uh, localizing value for this nystagmus is going to be in the posterior fossa, primarily in the cerebellum. It has a downbeat nystagmus itself has a very, very high localizing value. And the character of nystagmus is not very diagnostic. That means whether it is more in the lateral gaze or in the down gaze or an up gaze, will not be able to tell you what would be the cause of this nystagmus. It's just going to tell you that you need to look at the posterior fossa of this particular uh, group of patients. And the commonest causes for uh, such young patients is a congenital malformation, such as Arnold Chiari malformation type 1 or type 2, or tumors of posterior fossa. If it was an older person beyond 50, 60 years of age, then maybe you would have th thought of a degeneration or an infarction rather. And uh, this particular patient had no other systemic or even ocular history. His vision was 6 by 6 in both eyes, fundus was absolutely normal. All ocular motility was otherwise absolutely normal. So suspecting the uh, abnormality in the posterior fossa and the cerebellar area, the neurologist advised the patient to go for an MRI brain. As you see over here, it is showing very typical herniation of the cerebellum, the cerebellar tonsils uh, below the foramen magnum with a significantly dilated spinal canal, uh, cervical canal which is called uh, hydroseringomyelia. That means it's been, uh, it's been there for some time before the patient was referred to us. He did undergo a neurosurgical intervention, but this was his video nystagmography around six months post-surgery when he was referred to us. As you see over here, horizontal nystagmograph doesn't show any significant abnormality, but vertically showing significant amount of pendular or, in fact, if you see very carefully, there are certain phases which are corrective downbeat phases. So here it is, this is within the, on an x-axis you have a, uh, this is one second and in one second you have three uh, spikes. The right eye, this is the right eye video in stogmograph and as the eye moves up, uh, as you see over here, it slowly moves up and then there is a corrective phase. So this is a downbeat nystagmus as picked up by the uh, video nystagmograph with the uh, frequency of three hertz and an amplitude of around eight to ten degrees. So the treatment uh, initially was the neurosurgical, but since it was not able to re relieve his symptoms, which was anyways not expected because of hydroseringomyelia being already present, uh, he sought the treatment with us. And the treatment is based on this particular circuitry. As you see over here, the superior rectus uh, are stimulated, superior rectus as well as the inferior oblique. Both the elevators are stimulated by the anterior semicircular canal while the inferior is stimulated by the posterior uh, semicircular canal and the uh, brainstem uh, vestibular nucleus which is controlled by the Purkinje cells in cerebellum. These are inhibitory neurons which will be inhibiting an, an overactive anterior semicircular canal which is taking his eye up uh, was abnormal and then hence the treatment of choice was to rejuvenate those inhibitory circuits by giving him this potassium channel inhibitor called Empira. Unfortunately, Empira is very expensive as well as it's not available in India. Per tablet it costs around $13 and still not available in India. You have to import them and hence we had uh, this second choice of treatment which is an NMDA receptor antagonist it has a very good anti-glutamate property and instead of rejuvenating the Purkinje cells and not allow uh, and allow the inferior uh, muscles to correct for the superior abnormal uh, drive, uh, we started him on Mementin which will reduce the firing coming right, right from the anterior semicircular canal. We started the patient on 10 milligram thrice a day and asked him to watch for any lethargy or dizziness while uh, if there is any improvement that takes place. When he came back, this is how his uh, initial presentation was before he was started on the drug. And this is how he looks uh, when he comes a week later. And on our video recording, we were not very convinced that the drug is working. And he was also vehemently saying that the drug doesn't help. I think I'll need to get Empire from US. But when, you did the, when we did the uh, video on stepography for this particular patient, we realized there was a significant reduction in the, in the amplitude of the nystagmus. It did come down to around uh, 5 to 6 degrees of amplitude, as you see over here. 
there was a significant reduction in the nystagmus uh, amplitude. Though the patient was not able to appreciate, also we were not very uh, clinically able to appreciate the reduction in the amplitude of nystagmus. We just asked him to continue based on the VNG to increase the memente from 10 milligram to 20 milligram. Don't just get disheartened just with one week of 10 milligram and at end of uh, second week when he was on 20 milligram uh, he said uh, his oscillopsia has completely disappeared and his visual functions have been restored to what he had initially before he noticed an abnormality. And this is the video nystagmograph that he's persistently showing over last so many years now. So the, te the take home message here I want to give is the downbeat nystagmus has a very high localizing value. It's a straight shot uh, advice for an MRI scan as long as there is no other systemic history of alcohol or amiodarone or any other systemic drugs that the patient is taking in a young patient, you straightway go for the MRI scan. It's a central vestibular nystagmus. And tablet memantin, I think, was successful because we, we persisted with this drug uh, based on the video nystagmography. So video nystagmography here was helpful for us to pursue the patient. Presenting the second patient who is a 27-year-old male who is an IT professional, had a squint in the left eye since age of 12 years and he had uh, shaking of eyes also since then. The reason why he came to us was uh, he always had the blurred vision since that age and that used to increase uh, especially when he was more anxious and would try to maintain an eye to eye contact while he would initiate any communication with his client. As you see over here, he has a... As you see over here, he has a high frequency, a high amplitude, left beating, bilateral jerk nystagmus with a large exotropia with a V pattern and inferior oblique overaction, which measured around 65 prism diopter for near as well as distance. And he had a suppression of the left eye and his vision for near and distance was uh, 0 0.5. So near distance, no difference means there was no convergence dampening, which is which will otherwise uh, favor the diagnosis of infantile nystagmus syndrome. His best corrected and uncorrected visual acuity, is that because there was no refractive error, was same, and his monocular and binocular vision was also same. That means there is no latent component. Even on the cover test that you saw, there was no latent component in him. And also his uh, visual acuity would remain same in adduction as well as in abduction. There was no null point and there was no convergence dampening also. So the dilemma here is whether this is a fusional maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome or this is an infantile nystagmus syndrome. The reason why we want to differentiate is because uh, prognosis for fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome is, is, is amazing. It's the best nystagmus to have, that's what we felt, uh, to treat and gets the best visual outcome when you intervene in them versus infantile nystagmus syndrome where the prognosis for vision, fusion as well as reduction of nystagmus is also quite guarded even when you do an extensive four muscle surgeries for, for both the eyes. Uh, however, fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome is relatively less common in patients with nystagmus, but when a patient has an associated squint, then the chances of this patient having a, a fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome is much higher. And if you want to really understand how uh, they are different in terms of its uh, waveforms, then that was the paper of, by Lay to be uh, Deloso that needs to be read up. Now, this is a fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome patient having a decelerating slow phases. As you see over here, it's a very typical left beating nystagmus, and this is a decelerating slow phase and then a corrective fast phase. Uh, so, this was the actual uh, video nystagmograph of this particular patient having a uh, significant uh, nystagmus. Whenever it is more than or equal to 10 degrees, we have found even if it is an INS, it produces a significant uh, improvement in visual functions. So what would be the treatment once we diagnose this patient as having a fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome, then the treatment of choice is restore the fusion. Once you restore the fusion, the nystagmus is likely to get dampened. The patient is not only going to have a reduced nystagmus, but also a restored binocular uh, vision, fusion, three-dimensional vision, and improvement in visual acuity. However, as you see over here, Dr. Louis Deloso's paper on uh, whether to add tenotomy and reattachment in patients who have fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. Uh, if you do that, you have significant more dampening of uh, nystagmus, especially measurable on nystagmograph. And this is immediate post-op. Next day, post-operative uh, patient has had uh, uh, six muscles squint surgery. And 
This is at one year, he still maintains his fusion, stereopsis, uh, two lines improvement in visual acuity, and uh, clinically silent nystagmus, which is still uh, visible. This is post-operative uh, video nystagmograph. So the take-home message is when you see a patient with nystagmus uh, and you want to differentiate uh, the latent type of nystagmus or FMNS versus INS, again, nystagmography is a very good investigation to uh, differentiate them. And adding a tenotomy and reattachment to just a correction of strabismus surgery can give you a clinically silent nystagmus in, in a significant number of patients. Do I have time, uh, Dr. Satya, for me to go to case 3? This is the third case, right? Yes, last ah, case. Please. So this is the third case who is, uh, who is a 30-year-old techie living in UK. And uh, he, was, uh, he just he contacted us because he was not getting his driving license due to the poor vision since a long time he was trying. And uh, he was diagnosed with uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome and was given a crossover trial of uh, gabapentin and memantine for a study by a very leading nystagma specialist in UK and he was not found to have any significant improvement in his visual acuity for him to go ahead uh, and get his license. So he came to Mumbai for the treatment and this is the kind of nystagma graph that he had with a, a, a breaking uh, saccade over here with a good amount of foveation there. His visual acuity when he presented was a 6 by 12 as you see over here. He underwent four muscle tenotomy and reattachment surgery. He, he had a, a slight improvement in visual acuity. As you see over here, it was two lines on Logmar chart. It will be one line on a Snellen chart. And then he was started on Azopt eye drops, as you see over here. And his visual acuity became 6 by 6 partial. And around three months post surgery, while he was on Azopt, he emailed to us saying that he's got the driving license. So what I want to convey over here is you have uh, absorbed eye drops as well as surgery which both of them are not only independently has a potential to reduce the uh, nystagmus but when you use it together it, it just adds up because surgery is done on horizontal recti, it was not done on the vertical recti. So when you use absorbed eye drops it does work on the vertical recti where also the anthesial nerve endings are there. We have found it to be useful in certain group of patients, around 30 to 40 percent of our patients with INS, they have a continued uh, improvement on uh, with their uh, azopt eye drops as they continue to use. And those patients who are treating nystagmus, just not look at the, the frequency and amplitude. Instead, you use an eye movement recorder. If you don't have an access to it, at least do these two functions. One is called nystagmus function questionnaire 14, NFQ 14 and use gaze dependent acuity. You check their visual acuity in primary gaze and 10 degrees plus 10 degrees on each of the sides so that the visual improvement even if it is not uh, manifest in visual acuity at least if you find an improvement in the gaze dependent acuity it translates into a significant visual improvement in the functions of patients suffering from nystagmus. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Meher.